Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door, and I'm here roadside again on uh, another episode on the roadside and meadow plants that I find, well, just basically just outside my door. Today's episode is going to be on teasel, and you can see it growing behind me. I hope you'll also check out my other meadow plant episodes to get the whole story on these meadows that I have here in the state of Virginia. You can find those episodes in my meadow plant playlist, and they include things like chicory, great mullein, milkweed, Queen Anne's lace, and Joe Pieweed. In this episode, I want to share six things you ought to know about this amazing plant known as teasel. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. So you know I'm fascinated by these roadside weeds or these meadow flowers that bloom and grab our attention here in late fall. Some are native, some are non-native, some are referred to as being naturalized, some are a little bit invasive, and some are very invasive in some areas and not invasive in other areas. This flower today that I'm featuring is called teasel, and the species I have here is called cutleaf teasel, and it has white flowers. The other teasel that's common here in Virginia has pink or purplish flowers, and it's called fuller's teasel, and sometimes called wild teasel. The flowers themselves, of course, are very beautiful and have such a unique structure. So the first thing I wanna share with you in this video is how to identify the plants and learn a little bit about its features and its biology. These unique flowers may have 500 to 1,000 individual little flowers on each flower head. Flowers will open up in waves, kind of moving up and down across this surface. And the flower itself, the individual flower, will only open for one day. The plant itself can be five or six feet tall, as we see it here, it has a very spiny stem. In fact, it's got spines all over, and it even has spines under its leaves. The leaves, as the name implies, cut leaf, they are finely divided, and they're very, very unusual leaves if you look at them. And they have these very, very ominous spines on their back. These spines run up and down the stems and look very fierce and certainly are a discouragement for herbivory. These opposite leaves clasp the stem, and where they clasp the stem, they come together and form a little cup. And this brings up another name for the teasel. So teasel is often referred to as Venus cup because of this little Venus basin that's here. And we'll talk about that later in this episode. The second thing you should know about teasel is that it's a biannual. And being a biannual, that means it doesn't flower or produce seeds in its first year. And it can take two years for it to fully develop. Some of the plants may actually take three or four or more to develop, but basically we'll consider it a biannual. So in the first year, the plant produces a rosette of leaves. And these very thick green, rosette of leaves gathers sunlight to create photosynthesis and produce starches and sugars that are sent down to a taproot and stored to the next year. Then the second year, this plant will sprout up and turn into the familiar teasel plant that we know and produce the tall stems, the spines, and the flowers using energy it's stored from the year before plus the energy it's creating by photosynthesis from the leaves that it has now. It will produce thousands and thousands of seeds per head that will uh, germinate in the future, and it only reproduces by this germination. It's not a perennial, so in order to come back, it has to sprout by seeds. And so that's part of the secret to controlling it in places where it's invasive. The third thing that I'd like you to know about teasel some of its amazing historical uses. I'm fascinated by these plants and how learning their name opens up a door to allow me to research their historical background. Since medieval days, the flower heads 
have been used in textile and wool and cloth processing for literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The teasel head becomes a natural comb for cleaning, aligning, and raising the nap on fabrics, particularly wool. Commercially dried flower heads were attached to spindles or wheels or cylinders and used to spin and turn over reams of cloth, particularly wool, to raise that nap and create a very soft product. Sometimes there are as many as 3,000 flower heads in these wheels so that they needed to grow them agriculturally and commercially for this purpose. By the 20th century, most of these mills replaced the teasel heads with uh, metal combs or metal cards. But some said, yeah, that didn't work as well as the old ones because the old ones would give some and while the metal ones could snatch onto a fiber and instead of breaking off, saving the cloth, it would tear the fabric open. So there's still some users of teasel and say that it proves a better product and also it's pretty cool to use some of the old ways to make things today. And speaking of today, these are very, very popular in flower arrangements. The seeds heads and the stalk are very persistent and will often stand for years outdoors. So they make a great decorative part of indoor flower arrangements. The fourth thing I want to share with you about these plants is the mysterious Venus Basin. The mysterious water captured between the two leaves that are clasping the stem. And if you look inside these, you will sometimes see insects that have drowned in there. So there's a number of people that believe that this plant is a carnivorous plant, or at least on the path to carnivory, or a precursor to carnivorous plants like pitcher plants, which in fact have a uh, basin of water in them that contain digestive enzymes and remove nutrients or digest insects, remove nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and minerals that they can't get from nutrient poor acidic soils. So there's some discussion about whether or not teasel actually gets nutrients from these insects or if it's just a sort of an oddity or an artifact. It is debated among scientists and there's been some studies and there's continuing studies, but none I believe are entirely conclusive to answer the question, is this really a carnivorous plant? Fifth thing I wanted you to know about these plants is its medicinal history. Now this is a non-native plant to North America. And so to find its medicinal history, we need to trace back to Europe and Asia where it originally came from. In fact, in Chinese medicine, this shows up in many, many different medicinal recipes and medicinal prescriptions. It's most often associated with healing in the skeletal system, including tendons and ligaments and uh, bones. It is said to help heal broken bones. It's said to help reduce pain in joints and is often applied uh, in that manner. It's considered a detoxifying herb and a boost to the immune systems. But one of the most curious uses is more recent and it has been used by some herbalists for helping with Lyme disease. It's not a cure-all, it's not touted as a cure-all, but it's said to draw out the bacteria from tissues and bring them into the bloodstream where your own antibiotics or antibiotics supplied by doctors can attack those bacteria more frequently. Now, I'm not a herbalist and I'm not advocating the use of this plant. Uh, people would make tinctures of this from the root, grinding the root up and mixing it with alcohol and then filtering in it and using that as a medicine. But if you want to learn more about that, check herbalist websites and always talk to your doctor before doing any kind of herbal treatment. That's my disclaimer. Another folklore medicinal use of this, though I think it's highly suspect and I would never want to do this, and I would say it's more legend, but if you dip your finger into this and touch it to your eyes, it'll help alleviate eye problems. I don't think I'd recommend that. The sixth thing you should know about this plant is that it is invasive in some places. I've read some research about it pretty much taking over much of Illinois prairies 
It's a big problem in the Midwest. It creates these monocultures of nothing but teasel. Now it does have some benefits. The flowers do attract pollinators, particularly long-tongued pollinators because the nectar is pretty far back. So bumblebees and butterflies will use this plant like this monarch butterfly here, this silver spotted skipper, and of course these long-tongued bumblebees. It's a favorite for tiger swallowtails and many other species as well. It seems here in Virginia, I haven't seen it overtaking fields. I do see it along roadsides. In fact, I've only seen it along roadsides. And so where I filmed this was on a roadside and I had to get away from traffic and do this part of the narrative a little bit farther away from the road. There's no thistle behind me, but I did want you to know that it grows here in Virginia and it appears to me mostly invading roadside habitat, so I'm not sure that it's really displacing all that many native species. I know that some of you in the Midwest will look at this and say, oh my gosh, Frank, you have no idea how invasive it is here. For me here in Virginia, it's just another plant, another part of this mix of meadow flowers made up of native, non-native, and perhaps what we might refer to as naturalized plants in these meadows. Thanks for watching this episode on Nature at Your Door. Check out my meadow plants playlist for more on plants like this. I hope you learned some new things about teasel and gained a little bit of appreciation for this, well, this weed. And remember, if you like what I do on this channel, please subscribe, give me a like, and I love hearing from my viewers. Let me know what you think of this video and tell me if easel's invasive near you. And remember, I cover all things nature frogs, toads, snakes, and turtles, the myriapoda, insects, trees, wildflowers, and fungi. I cover all the things you might encounter just outside your door. Thanks again for watching this episode of Nature at Your Door.